Most of you probably know that Caesar's name is the source of the German word Kaiser and the Russian word Tsar. The etymology here is quite obvious. Caesar was used as a title of Roman emperors and became closely associated with imperial power throughout Europe. Caesar and his heir Octavian also gave us the names for July and August respectively. But there are other, less famous Romans whose names became nouns and even adjectives in different languages. In this video we're going to talk about three of them. So let's see who they are. Lucius Licinius Lucullus was a Roman general born in 118 BC. He was a loyal supporter of Lucius Cornelius Sulla and was the only officer who followed him under arms into the boundaries of the city of Rome. After the famous dictator abdicated, Lucullus maintained his position in the highest echelons of Roman power. Eventually, he landed a promising appointment in the eastern provinces to oversee the war with the kingdom of Pontus. Lucullus handed a series of defeats to the Pontic king Mithridates, making him run for his life to the court of his son-in-law, Armenian king Tigranes. He then destroyed the army of Tigranes and captured his capital. So far, you might think that Lucullus's name became associated with military genius and excellent generalship, but you will be mistaken. Despite continuous success in battle, Lucullus was unable to capture either Pontic or Armenian king for several years. Eventually, his soldiers, tired of this wild goose chase in the hostile Armenian mountains, refused to go any further, and Lucullus was recalled to Rome. Upon returning to the capital, Lucullus found his political standing completely eroded. Mostly through the machinations of Pompey the Great, Lucullus was denied a triumph, and his prospects of gaining another office looked bleak. Instead of grasping at the straws of his waning relevance, Lucullus decided to retire. He had brought a huge amount of loot from the east and was pretty much set for life. He bought himself half a dozen luxurious villas across Italy and dedicated his sunset years to gastronomic extravagance. He cultivated a variety of fruits and vegetables not known to the Romans before. On his vast estates, Lucullus raised all sorts of animals, birds and fish and could provide any imaginable delicacy all year round. His villas had dozens of dining rooms, each with its own gastronomic specialization. Instead of his military glory, Lucullus became famous for the luxurious feasts and banquets. His gastronomic extravagances became legendary among the Roman elite. Pompey and Cicero once tried to figure out what Lucullus ate on his own and unexpectedly invited themselves to a dinner in his house. Instead of giving his slaves extensive instructions about what meals should be prepared for the guests, Lucullus simply announced that they will be dining in their polo room. The slaves knew the arrangements of every dining room in the house by memory, so the guests soon found themselves munching on exotic delicacies, amazed at the speed with which they were prepared. So famous were the banquets of Lucullus that the word Locolon became a byword for gastronomic luxury. It's more of an archaic word, but you may occasionally see it in some fancy journal. Here are some dishes you might need for a Locolon feast, according to the New York Times article about a 1970 Christmas invitation dinner. Deviled scallops, mushroom laparus, eggs muscovite, lobster en bellevue, and quenelle de brochette. They also provide recipes for some of the dishes, so you can try and prepare your own Locolon feast. I doubt that this is how Lucullus imagined his legacy when he was shattering the Armenian army at the Battle of Tigranocerta, but life and history often take very unexpected turns. Gaius Kilnius Maecenas, or Messinus, was one of the closest friends and advisors of the first Roman Emperor Augustus since his youth, while Octavian's other friend, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, handled the military affairs. Messinus was put in charge of diplomatic outreach. During Octavian's rise to power, Messinus helped him to establish important connections with Roman elites. He assisted Caesar's heir in navigating the world of Roman intrigue and in maintaining a positive public image. He was present at every negotiation, making sure that his friend and patron wasn't going to be ripped off. The degree of Octavian's trust towards Mycenaeus was only comparable to that towards Agrippa. When the future emperor was on campaign, he would give Messinus full control of the city's affairs. 
Mathenus proved himself to be an exceptional diplomat and administrator, but his most famous occupation is that of a patron of arts. He oversaw the intricate cultural propaganda campaign of Augustus. Its main vector was inducing the prominent Roman artists to paint the Augustan regime in positive light. Among the most famous clients of Messinus were the great poets Horace and Virgil. Horace praised Augustus in his odes, written in a style of Hellenistic court poetry. Virgil's commission was even grander. His masterpiece, The Aeneid, is a composition of disparate folk tales made into a Roman national epic. Taking the stories of Aeneas's journey, Virgil wrote a poem that connected the reigning emperor with the Olympic gods and the heroes of the Trojan War. The poets also didn't forget to mention their direct patron. Horace dedicated the very first of his odes to Maecenas, and Virgil wrote an entire poem in his honor. Later Roman artists praised his charity as well. This fame persisted through the ages and made Maecenas's name a byword for a patron of the arts. 13th century student song Gaudamus has the words Long live our city and the charity of Maecenas that protects us here. It isn't a common word in modern English, but all of Romance and even Slavic languages use the derivatives of his name to signify patronage of the arts and philanthropy. Out of the three heroes of this video, Messinus would probably be the most satisfied with his legacy. Having your name become the word for what you did in life is the ultimate form of recognition. Couldn't have worked out better, frankly. It must be nice to have your name be synonymous with the patronage of the arts or lavish feasts. But how would you feel if your name was associated with public urination? This is the case of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Titus Flavius Vespasianus became the emperor in 69 AD. He had a very successful 10-year reign, during which he pacified the imperial frontiers, expanded the Roman domain in Britain, and started multiple urban construction projects. Among those were the Temple of Peace, new public baths, and of course the great Flavian Amphitheater, better known today as the Colosseum. But how did Vespasian pay for all these projects? Well, among other financial measures, the Emperor introduced the urine tax. Despite what you might think, given its name, the Romans did not have to pay the government every time they peed. Urine was a valuable commodity in the ancient Rome because of its ammonia content. The ammonia could be used to bleach fabric and even to whiten teeth. The urine trade was quite lucrative, so Vespasian taxed the sale of urine that was gathered at public toilets. This event is also the source of the saying, money does not stink. Suetonius writes that when Vespasian's son Titus complained about the disgusting nature of the tax, his father held up a gold coin and asked whether he felt offended by its smell. When Titus said no, Vespasian replied, but it comes from urine. An interesting story so far, but what word came of it? For this we need to go to the 19th century France. In the 1830s, the Parisian government decided to install public urinals on the streets of the city. The effort was overseen by the Parisian prefect, Claude Philibert Barthelot, Count of Rambuteau. From outside, these urinals looked like columns, so the people called them Rambuto Columns. The Count, who didn't want to associate his title with public urination, suggested they call them Vespasien, in reference to the Emperor and his urine tax. From that point, it became a name for public urinals. The French stopped building the old school Vespasien in the first half of the 20th century, but it's still a common word for the public toilet. You can find an old Vespasien in a lot of parks in the French-speaking world. The word also made a comeback in Italy, where the public urinals are unofficially called Vespasiani. So that's the etymological legacy of Vespasian. Some other emperor might have gotten offended if he learned that his name is a byword for a public urinal. But we know that Vespasian had a great sense of humor, so I think he wouldn't have minded at all. I hope you found this video interesting. Tell me in the comments if your native language has a word with ancient Roman origins. Thanks a lot for watching till the end, and I will see you in the next one.